I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Earl Palmer Ministries to a morning with Tolkien and Lewis. We are very excited and very glad that you're all here. We've been anticipating this day for a while. Some of you are very familiar with Earl Palmer Ministries and, and Earl and know his teaching and preaching. Um, maybe have been mentored by him. And some of you, perhaps you're newer uh, to Earl Palmer Ministries. Maybe you came as a guest. Uh, in either case, you're in for a treat as we get to um, hear from Earl about these two um, amazing, remarkable men and the contribution uh, that they made at their time and, and the relevance for today. So we're very grateful you're here. And we are hoping that you experience joy. As Tolkien talks about um, that reality that brings a catch of the breath and a beat and lifting of the heart. Hello, everyone. If you could uh, just bow your heads in prayer with me. Hey, God. Thank you for this gathering of people who are desiring to learn more about two great Oxford scholars that loved you. I ask that what we learn today can lead to growth in our lives, especially growth in relationship towards you. Thank you for Earl Palmer and his desire to teach us. I ask that you give him the words to speak today. I thank you for everyone here who took time out of their days to learn, to serve, and to be in fellowship with one another. I ask that they will be blessed by what they hear today. God, I thank you for who you are and that you love us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Well, thanks, Zach and the, Renee, and what a joy to have all of you here for this event. It's just a, uh, it's, it's a privilege to be able to be with you and also to uh, focus our attention on two great English authors. I wrote a I'm having feedback myself right now, but uh, I, I wrote a paper on uh, Tolkien and Lewis, which uh, is on your tables, and there's one line that I just want to read uh, about these men. Both men are like friends we wish we knew. Both are oddly contemporary to us as their stories, letters, essays, and persuasive books allow us to know how they think and we are the better for it. In a way, that's what we're going to do today, is to take a journey first in the lives of both men, and then in the second hour especially, we're going to look at two of their great stories to see how they thought, and how what they thought about and what they wrote in their stories, we call them stories of the marvelous, because they both wrote stories that would, some would call fantasy stories, but stories of the marvelous is the way Lewis put it also Tolkien, how what they wrote, uh, those stories move into reality and have a, have a way of impacting us and the way we think about life. And so that we're going to look for in the second hour. But in the first hour, we want to just track the, lore, the stories of their own lives, J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. John Ronald Rule Tolkien. He was seven years older than C.S. Lewis. At the age of nine, uh, with his brother Hillary, who was age seven, he came from South Africa with his mother, uh, Mabel, because of J.R., they, they, they always called him John Ralph, because of John Ralph's breathing problems. He had uh, respiratory problems. They will later play a part in his time in World War I. But he had breathing problems. and. In, in the heat of where they were in South Africa, it, he was not doing well. So they came. His father, uh, author, was an Englishman. He was a banker. And he had taken his family to South Africa as, as a part of, the, uh, 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 of his work as a banker. And so he stayed behind. And Mabel and the two boys came to England. And then a, a, a tragedy really struck this family because the father, at age 39, dies of a brain hemorrhage in, in South Africa. Abe Mabel is not even able uh, to go uh, for his funeral or burial. The boys and she are there stuck in South Africa. And he had virtually no insurance, so they're stuck in immediate abject poverty. 
uh, she lives sort of with her sister in a way. And for those early days, uh, they live in a kind of a tenement. Uh, interestingly enough, above the railroad yards of uh, Birmingham. And so that's where Tolkien first developed his love of words and his love of strange words because the coal cars came from Wales and they had Welsh names on every coal car. One coal car was called Gamgee. So that name becomes a big name in Lord of the Rings. But at any rate, he and his brother with their mother are there in, in England. They had been raised as Anglicans and went to the Anglican church, but it was quite a, a job to get over to the Anglican church. And so uh, Mabel with her sister began to go to a Roman Catholic church uh, called the, the uh, 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 in Birmingham. And they went to this Roman Catholic church and there uh, they were converted to Catholicism and joined the Catholic church, which for which she paid a heavy price with her Protestant family because the Protestant family at that time uh, were very, very hostile to the fact that this young Mabel had decided with her sister to join the Catholic Church. The priest in, that, in their parish was Father uh, Francis Xavier Morgan. He had been an assistant to Cardinal John Henry Newman. So he was a, quite a formidable uh, past as an assistant and then now is the pastor in that church. And so she became a member of that Catholic fellowship. Then, uh, if because of their uh, poverty and, and difficulty, she is uh, also uh, gets becomes ill, uh, perhaps for other reasons too. She de develops diabetes, and she dies at age thirty four. Uh, so now you've got Tolkien having lost his father at, at age nine and loses his mother at age twelve. Uh, then an amazing thing happens. Father Francis Xavier Morgan adopts the two boys, Hillary and uh, John Ralph. He adopts them. He had his own source of income. He was a Roman Catholic priest, but had his own source of income from family uh, uh, investments that the family had in, in, the, in the wine industry. And so he adopts these two boys and then puts them into a home uh, which is a home for uh, orphaned children. And that's the home where uh, he puts the boys and then becomes, in effect, their uh, borrowed father. Uh, I like the way Tolkien himself describes this. He says, I witnessed half comprehendingly the heroic suffering and the early death and extreme poverty of my mother who brought me into the church and received the astonishing charity of Francis Morgan. And I fell in love with the blessed sacrament from the beginning. J.R. Tolkien would go to mass every single day of his life from that point on. He was a de very devout member of the church and uh, very devout in his faith. And he was so grateful to Father Morgan. And Father Morgan was an amazing influence. He had a great sense of humor, had a robust personality himself. But he, he uh, raised these two boys. Thank God for this Roman Catholic priest and for his faithfulness to raise these boys. He was strict, too. Uh, <laughs> Tolkien now goes into the, into the orphanage, in a sense, his orphan home, uh, which is being paid for by Father Brown, uh, Father Morgan. And he goes into this home, and, uh, and then he promptly, at age 13, falls in love with a girl who's older than he is in that same home. Her name is, is Edith, and he falls in love with her. And Francis Morgan uh, is quite alarmed that now the 14-year-old boy is in love with Edith. So he, he prohibits him from writing any love letters to this girl and says, you cannot do that until you're 21. <laughs> and so he sets that strict rule and of course, then Edith soon is out of the home because she's several years older and she's now out. But he has that strict rule that Tolkien is not to have any contact with this girl because uh, he did not want him to interrupt his education. He wanted him to be educated. And he was afraid if he fell in love and got married to this girl and, and she, was, uh, she was really a teacher's aide is what she was doing, 
after she got out of the, you know, the home. So Tolkien faithfully obeyed that with just three small slips. And the slips were a little bit innocent. Like they met at a train station and then they talked and then they wrote a letter. And then Father, he told that, he confessed that to Father uh, Morgan, who said, I told you, I don't want you to have any, any contact with her until you're 21. And then actually at age 21, now Tolkien is in the army. He's at age 21 and he, but he waited uh, and honored Father Morgan. And then at age 21, he does contact her and finds out she's engaged to another man. And so then he wins her uh, out of that engagement. And, uh, and he does marry Edith. And it, it, by the way, one of the most touching, one of the books on Tolkien is the, is the book by Humphrey Carpenter, simply called Tolkien. And in that it tells in tenderness that when they went to be married, first to get registered in the registration office, uh, in, to her uh, embarrassment, there is no name. Her, her birth certificate is blank on who is her father. She has no father. She is an illegitimate girl in, in, in terms of having any father to put down in the marriage license. So she then uh, just decides to put her uncle's name, Brat, uh, Philip Brat, as her father, which is just an uncle. And so that's why she's Edith Brat. That's her name. And she was so embarrassed, she felt that this would really just totally uh, affect uh, Tolkien. And young Tolkien is so, ten so tender, he said, oh, no, no. Edith, you've got a name now, Tolkien. That's your name. And, uh, and he said, uh, we leave everything in God's hands, but you don't need to know who your father is. You've got Tolkien now as your name. And so they got married. They ended up with four children, three boys, outstanding boys, and then a daughter named Priscilla. Uh, the oldest son, John, will later become a Roman Catholic priest himself. And interestingly, his name by J.R. Tolkien will name that boy John Francis Rule Tolkien. So he honors uh, Father Francis Xavier Morgan. Uh, in uh, in his education now, now that he is uh, under the, uh, you might say, under the protection of Father Morgan, he is put in very fine schools. He goes to St. Edward's School, which is in, in Birmingham was considered the elite school in that, in that city. And he ha does what he always will do. Tolkien makes friends. And he made four friends in that elite school uh, uh, at, at uh, King Edward's school. G.B. Smith and Robert Gilson and Chris Wiseman, these three boys joined with J.R. and they formed a club. They form, and you'll see later, this will be a pattern in Tolkien to form these little organizations that he'll form. They formed a club that, and since they met for tea at this place called the Baronum, they named their club the TC, T Club, at the Baronial Society. They didn't say restaurant, they said society. So that became their group. And they always just referred to it always as T, uh, T, C, B, S. And that was their group. And they called themselves the Immortal Four. And they were devoted, because, now you can see the influence of Tolkien, he was the ringleader for sure. They were devoted to language and to creating new languages. They were trying to create brand new languages. From these coal cars, he got the idea of, he was fascinated with Welsh. He ended up being fascinated with the Icelandic language. And Tolkien turns out to be a language genius, a philologist, that's because of his profession. But these boys are totally enamored and writing stories with their new languages. In fact, in one case, Smith said to Tolkien, now where is the story going? Because he keep reading the stories to each other. And he says, I don't know. I'll have to find out from the story where it's going. Now that's a very interesting clue when you get down to Lord of the Rings. I'll find out from the story where it's going. Because the language and the story making was a huge part of his life. So 
Uh, he marries at age 21. <laughs> uh, no, no, he, he, he takes, uh, he does have a proper engagement with her and marries uh, two years later. But he marries, uh, he now has to go to World War I. And he, he jo- becomes an officer uh, in, the, in, in World War I and uh, goes with, uh, in those days, in, in the, in, in that time in World War I, uh, the British made a huge mistake, mistake. You'll see the same thing will happen to Lewis later when he goes to war. They will take boys from a village and they'll put them in the same unit. So they'll be, they'll be, that'll be a part of the name of their unit. And so Tolkien was in a, such a unit that was uh, the fuselage, uh, f- fuselage movement uh, uh, unit. And he was a signal corpsman in that unit became an officer, and uh, they were then sent to the front, and they were in the the Valley of the Somme River. And the Valley of the Somme was the grimmest part of World War I. If you saw the Downtown Abbey films, they showed, they did a big thing to show how horrible World War I was on the trenches of the the Valley Somme. In fact, in one stretch, this is the stretch when Tolkien was there, from June till August, 615,000 Allied casualties and 500,000 German casualties in that one stretch just through the summer, and many, many deaths. And of course, the Germans had invented the submachine gun, the Thompson machine gun, which the British didn't know was being invented. And when the British method of warfare to come up out of the trenches and move forward made them just sitting targets for being mowed down in that terrible time of the Battle of Somme. Tolkien, but for, for, for uh, health reasons, Tolkien's respiratory problems really began to haunt him and it, it fouled him up in, as a young officer. And he had, to be, uh, he had to be evacuated from France. And he was evacuated actually to an English hospital where he has to recuperate uh, because of, of lung difficulty in, uh, from trench fever. And in that time, uh, two of his four friends are killed in the Battle of Somme. On the very first day of their engagement in the battle, uh, uh, Rob Gilnet, Gilson is killed. And G.B. Smith, his other great friend, is uh, uh, devastatingly wounded and is in a field hospital in France in which he writes a letter to Tolkien. And uh, the, the letter is very touching because uh, he, writes, he writes to Tolkien this letter. He said, may God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say long after I am not here to say them, if such be my lot. And Tolkien later said uh, about his commitment to writing stories, because he then was, they, they were all writing stories and they now commissioned so now, even in his deathbed, G.B. Smith, only one of the, of the four of his other friends, my Wiseman, actually joined the Navy, so he survived World War I. But both boys, Gilded and, uh, and Smith, were killed. And so uh, he later said, a real taste for fairy stories was wakened by philology, my love of language, on the threshold of my manhood and it was quickened to full life by war. War is when he decided he had to write, and he had to write stories like they were writing, and they wanted to know where the story was gonna go. He said, I'll have to let the story tell me. And so he started, even then, this would be 19, in the 19, early 20s now, he's out of the war, he's, the war is over, and he is, uh, he, uh, Thanks to Father Morgan, he was educated at, at Exeter in Oxford, and that was done, that was all paid for by his, his great priest mentor. And then he now gets employed at Oxford, first Leeds, and then Oxford in philology, and becomes a professor of Anglo-Saxon by 1925, and uh, lives in Oxford. Uh, he also begins then to write the stories that we're going to look at in, in the second hour. He starts to write for Silmarillion, which was the, the sources of Middle-earth and the beginnings of this Middle-earth uh, world that he was creating with a language of its own and everything. 
uh, even script. He designs script for the language, and uh, he is very busy at that, even as far back as 1925. In fact, he'll work on this story. He'll work on this story for 17 years. And I'll just give this little tidbit. Later, when he does become a great friend of C.S. Lewis's, which will happen in 1926 on, they become great friends. But he will write uh, and, and be working on this story. And finally, he'll bring out a small segment of the story called The Hobbit and will publish it as a children's story in 1936. And it does quite well. It's a fairly well-received story. And, but he's still working on the major work, and it, it, the Silmarillion, and, which is the sources and the beginnings of Middle-earth, and then, of course, the Lord of the Rings, his, his great epic story. And he's working on it, and he gets uh, all the way through his connection with Lewis and the others and the Kinklings. He will be reading from what he is writing. And at first, the people in the Inklings were welcoming it, and finally, they began to resist it and said, we're getting tired of Tolkien's, or they called him Tolly, of Tolly's hobbits. We're getting tired of, because he created people too, and he created the hobbits as a people. And we're tired of his hobbits. One of his friends was not tired of the hobbits, and that was the one who really loved stories more than all the others that were in the Inklings. This group, again, met almost every week of scholars in Oxford. They, they had one pub they loved called the Eagle and the Child. And anybody that makes a trip to Oxford always goes to the Eagle and the Child. Now the, the restaurant has sort of made a little shrine because Lewis and Tolkien and Charles Williams and Lewis's brother and doctor and a few other people met there and then people would listen in. And so now there's a kind of a little shrine to the fact that they met there all the time. And then they would also go to the Lamb and they would go to other pubs and and the Eastgate Hotel, where they loved to talk. And so the, the other Inklings began to get tired of it. And, uh, but, uh, but Tolkien uh, kept reading it to Lewis. And finally, he and Lewis alone would go to Lewis's. He couldn't go to Tolkien's house because Tolkien by now has a house full of kids. And he actually makes the garage his study because he's got the house full of kids. And so they can't meet in his house because uh, he's got all that. And so he has to go over to Lewis's quarters. So almost all these readings that Lew he was doing with Lewis and with the Inklings were done in, on Lewis's turf. And they became very dear friends in that journey with his special language and special story that he's working on. And finally, uh, I, I will jump ahead a little bit and say <clears throat> that as he finally gets to the point in the uh, late 40s and 50s, uh, when the story is it's published you know, in 1954, he's been working on it since 1925, and it's massive. And, uh, but he's got a publisher finally, the publisher that published The Inklings, uh, that published the, uh, the Hobbit, is willing to publish it. But they were a little scared because there's a paper shortage in the 40s, at the end of the 40s. And when they showed the massive manuscript to this company that he had done uh, The Hobbit with, they said, yes, uh, but maybe we can break it into other stories and stuff like that. And he, but he didn't want anyone to touch anything he wrote. He did not like editors to touch. Dorothy, by the way, Dorothy Sayers was that way too. You don't touch anything that Dorothy Sayers wrote. You don't touch anything that Telkin wrote. And so he's not, allowed, he's not gonna allow editors to, to hammer it down and make it more presentable. And uh, only Lewis uh, is still sold on it. And, uh, and Lewis is the one that's insisting that he get it published. But at one point, uh, because there was resistance, uh, uh, because of the length of it, uh, he, he does decide that, well, okay, I'm gonna just give up on it and I'm not even going to try to get it published. And he writes this amazing, uh, and that, they asked him for an analysis of his, of his uh, great Lord of the Rings. And he says, my work has escaped my control. In other words, I can't, they said, well, why can't you bring it under control and get it smaller, shorter? 
that we because we can sell one book like we did the hobbit we can't sell so many things you've got too much and he wanted the silmarillion included in it so he said my work has escaped from my control he told them and i have produced a monster an immense now listen to his own description of his book which we now call one of the classics in english language he should have got the Nobel Prize for this book, by the way, but it was jealousy on the part of, uh, of some people that blocked it getting the Nobel Prize. But he said, uh, the, my work has escaped from my control. I have produced a monster, an immensely long, complex, rather bitter, and rather terrifying romance, quite unfit for children, <laughs> if it's fit for anybody. And it is not really a sequel to The Hobbit but to the Silmarillion. Ridiculous and tiresome as you may think me, I want to publish them both, the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings. And that's what I should like to do. And of course they said, we can't do both these books, it's just too much. And so finally, Lewis, uh, Lewis uh, talked him into just doing the Lord of the Rings. Just do that first. And when it was all over, Tolkien wrote this in his own uh, memoir. He said, the unpayable debt I owe to C.S. Lewis was not influenced as it is commonly understood. Nobody could influence Tolkien. You can't change a word of what he's written. But it was not influenced as is commonly understood, but sheer encouragement. He, for a long time, was my only audience. See, even the Inklings didn't want to hear any more about his hobbits. Lewis did. He wanted to hear about them. Tell me about them. What's happening in the story now? And his own kids did. He sent them to, by the way, his boys in the war were in the RAF. So he was deeply involved in World War II through his three sons who were all in great danger because many RAF pilots never came back alive. And those three sons, he would send them things he was writing from the Lord of the Rings. And they liked him. But Lewis liked them. But uh, nobody else particularly did, he felt. And he called it, it's become a monster. It's a, a book that is not even fit for children to read. But anyway, he said, I'm afraid that's the truth. But Lewis, he says, the unpayable debt I owe to C.S. Lewis is not influenced as is commonly understood, but sheer encouragement. Only from him did I ever get the idea, and here's the great line, only from him, Lewis, did I ever get the idea that my stuff could be anything more than a private hobby because he was really writing it at the beginning for his children, for his sons. He was really writing it for the sons and he said, they like it, but I guess nobody else is gonna, and it's not fit for children, ordinary children, I guess, and that's the story. But Lewis convinced him to publish it. Now here is an interesting, if you're a businessman, you'll get a kick out of this. So he went to his publisher who did Hobbit and they said, okay, okay, we will publish it. Because uh, he finally agreed not to include the Silmarillion, the great big Silmarillion too. We'll publish the Lord of the Rings and we won't cut a word out. We'll keep it all in. Okay, okay, okay. We'll do it. Uh, but, you know, uh, we don't particularly want to do it by giving you an advance. We would like to instead do it this way. We won't give you an advance, but we will give you a percentage of profits. Now that's what they did with authors they felt would not sell well. That way they published the book and you get, uh, you get a percentage of profits and when only 4,000 copies of the book sell, that means you get $12.50 for writing your book and that's all they owe you because it's a percentage of profits. Well, business people now know it's dangerous to do this because when they did this, do you realize what they did? This book became an absolutely incredible uh, when it was finally published and translated into virtually every language in the world. And the estate of J.R. Tolkien owns it. I just read the other day that the estate of J.R. Tolkien is negotiating with Disney about doing another go around with Lord of the Rings and they're talking about a $300 million stipend to the estate of J.R. Tolkien to have permission to work on Lord of the Rings again. So anyway, you owe a lot to Lewis and you owe a lot to Tolkien that he did finally agree. And also that publisher, they finally agreed to publish the book 
without anything added to it. Well, uh, now, Lewis. I want to tell you about C.S. Lewis. He was uh, younger. He, 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 uh, uh, the early years in his life were really quite happy. Born in, in Belfast, in Little Lee, his father was a solicitor, a lawyer, and they were really quite prosperous, except that his father always thought they were going to be very poor. And he said, we're going to end up in the poorhouse at the rate we're going. But they never did, of course. But the father was always saying that to the boys. But anyway, he, they were prosperous family. His mother was a wonderful woman named Flora Hamilton Lewis and warm and brilliant and just a fun loving woman. And, and so young Lewis had that growing up in those early years. In fact, he was having so much fun as a kid growing up in Little Lee that he one day comes up to his parents and says uh, he decides to name himself. He said, "My me, Jack. And he decided he was going to call himself Clive or Staples. Uh, well, I don't blame him for not wanting to be called Clive, but he said, I'm Jack. And from then on, everyone who knew Lewis called him Jack. His father added an S and called him Jax with an S on it. But everybody called him Jack from that point on, because when he was about eight years old, he said, my, my name is Jack, and that's who I am. But uh, a tragedy hit that family early on, especially for Lewis. When he was nine years old, his mother died of cancer after a very painful illness. And then, uh, that was August, uh, when uh, Lewis is only nine years old. And in that August, his mother dies. And uh, I like what Warren Lewis, Lewis's brother said, who was three years older than Lewis. Warren said, uh, that uh, with my father's uncanny flair for making bad decisions, uh, his father, at this boy, his mother dies in August, and in September, this nine-year-old boy is sent away from home to go to a prep school in England. And it was a bad prep school, too. And it was a horrible experience for Lewis. In fact, Lewis, in Surprised by Joy, which is the only autobiography that Lewis wrote, he has this very poignant line about the death of his mother. With my mother's death, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable, disappeared from my life. There was to be much fun, many pleasures, some stabs of joy, but no more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. What an, ama what an amazing description of the loss of his mother, who was the continent. And now everything else is just islands, islands and sea. But everything is, un is unsafe now. This is really the beginning of Lewis's loss of faith. Uh, you say, when did Lewis become a, a young atheist? And he did become an atheist. He certainly wasn't at the beginning because he prayed so earnestly for his mother's recovery and was sure she would be made well. She wasn't. And then afterward, uh, then he's sent to this terrible school, which he despised, which was. And the, the thing that made it the worst in that first school is that the headmaster was cruel and beat the boys in the school. But he picked favorites. And the worst thing that can happen to you in a situation like that is if you're picked as a favorite. So Lewis was a little boy, good looking little kid, and he was picked as the favorite by the headmaster. But he saw other boys being beaten, and he was called the favorite. And so that did harm. He was then in three different schools during these critical years. He hated every one of them. He pled with his father to let him get to go to, just to public school or go anywhere. To, I mean, to just the ordinary government school. These, what, what they call public school would be private schools. He pleaded not to be in these schools. And in several of them, he himself was... Uh, uh, bullied by others, and it was an unhappy experience. And finally, at age 16, uh, Lewis's brother makes this comment, much to my surprise, my father made an immediate, because Lewis was just pleading to get away from these schools, made, a, uh, a, made a, an immediate and a sensible decision. 
And at age 16, Lewis was sent to study with a man who had been the headmaster of Albert Lewis's school when he was in a private school. And he was W.T. Kirkpatrick. And W.T. Kirkpatrick becomes a huge influence in Lewis's life. You really can't understand the intellectual development of Lewis. He's already bright, but you can't understand the intellectual development without looking at that period in his life when he was sent to be a private live-in student with W.T. Kirkpatrick uh, in Surrey, England. And uh, I, I do want to read just a little bit of that introduction to Kirkpatrick that comes from Surprised by Joy. Lewis tells us in Surprised by Joy what it was like to be when he first met W.T. Kirkpatrick. He says when he got to the train station that he was six feet tall, very shabbily dressed like a gardener, I thought, lean as a rake, immensely muscular, wrinkled face seemed to consist entirely of muscles as far as was visible, for he wore a mustache and side whiskers like the Emperor Franz Joseph. So he said, I was trying to hold back. What's he going to do? Would he maybe kiss me? He, Lewis could not stand to be kissed by people. And so he said, I was afraid he would kiss me like sometimes uh, the, the headmasters would do. Remember, he had been a favorite of one of them. Apparently, the old man was holding his fire. We shook hands. And though his grip was like iron pincers, it did not last long. A few minutes later, we were walking away from the station. And you are now, said Kirk, pr proceeding along the principal artery between Great and Little Bookham. I stole a glance at him. He says, was he trying to conceal his emotions? His face, however, only showed inflexible gravity. And then he says, I began to make conversation in the deplorable manner which I had acquired at evening parties <clears throat> and indeed found incre increasingly necessary to use with my father. But you have to realize that when the two boys, Lewis and his older brother, now they're 16 and 15, 16 years old, when he would come back from England to go to Little Lee, the father would sit them down and then he would want to talk to them. And the boys discovered that they couldn't bring up any important subject because any subject like sex or politics or what was going on in the school, if he brought it up, they, he, the father would interrupt them after just a moment and say, oh, yes, I see it all clearly now, which he didn't, of course. And then he would pontificate for about 20 minutes. He was a brilliant man. So probably what he said was very wise and deep, but the boys hated it. So they learned that they had to only talk about the weather and the ship ride. And they found out that's all they could talk to their father about because then he wouldn't interrupt and say, yes, I see it all clearly now and uh, inter interrupt them. So it was, he said, so in the deplorable manner, I tried to make conversation like I did in the evening parties with my father. And I said, I was surprised at the scenery of Surrey. It was much wilder than I expected. Stop, shouted Kurt. With a suddenness, it made me jump. What do you mean by wildness? And on what grounds had you for not expecting it? And I replied, I didn't know, still making conversation, as answer after answer was torn to shreds. It dawned on me finally that he really wanted to know. He wanted to know why I used the word wild. See? He was not making conversation, nor joking, nor snubbing me. He wanted to know. I was stung to attempt a real answer. A few passes suffice to show that I had no clear idea or distinct idea corresponding to the word wildness. And so and that, insofar as I had any idea at all, wildness was a singularly inept word. You know, Wyoming is wild. England is not wild. Have you flown into a Heathrow? You look down, it's, it's like manicured, manicured gardens. Even on the sides of the roads where there are weeds, they cut them down and make it really neat. There's, everything is so neat. And so wild was an inept word. Yes, in Wyoming. Yes, in Montana. Not in Surrey. So anyway, he didn't know that. Then. He'd never been to Wyoming. So the word wildness was uh, singularly inept. And then, do you not see, then concluded the great knock. Oh, by the way, Lewis nicknames everybody. He nicknamed his father. They called the father OAB, which means old airbag, which is what he and his, his brothers always referred to their father as OAB. But, uh, and now he, he, he nicknames W.T. Kirkpatrick the great knock.
So do you not see then, concluded the great knock, that your remark was meaningless? Assuming that the subject would now be dropped, never uh, was I more mistaken in my life. Having analyzed my terms, Kirk was now proceeding to deal with my proposition as a whole. On what did I base, though he pronounced it advised, my expectation about the flora and the geology of Surrey? Was it maps, or was it photographs, or was it books? I could produce none. I had, heaven help me, never occurred to me that what I thought were my thoughts needed to be advised on anything. Kirk once more drew a conclusion without the slightest sign of emotion, but equally without the slightest concession to what I thought were good manners. <laughs> Do you not see then? You had no right to have any opinion whatsoever on the subject. Now, you, you later discovered, by the way, Lewis came to love this man. He's pulling his leg, of course, but he's teaching him a great lesson. Know the meaning of every word you use. And the one thing you can never complain about Lewis in his writing is he doesn't know the meaning of words. Words, he's not the philologist that Tolkien was, but he is also a great man of language. And it's funny, he comes to adore this man. Uh, by the way, uh, Kirkpatrick was an atheist himself, but he never tried to convert Lewis to atheism. He had been a Presbyterian. There is a funny part of that, though. Every Sunday, to Lewis uh, says, Tolkien, uh, W.T. Kirkpatrick, would dress up with a necktie and everything as if he were going to church. That's the, the hangover from having been a Presbyterian and going to church and dressing up. So he would dress up and then he would do gardening. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he didn't see the incongruity in it all. Sunday, you dress up, even if you're going to do gardening. But he was an atheist, and, uh, but a brilliant man. And Lewis did become an intellectual atheist during all this time. Uh, and, uh, and, but not a cynic. He was not cynical. Lewis says, he says later, I lacked the cynic's nose. I didn't have that, but I was, I, I, I lost my faith and didn't have faith. And he argues, we know a lot about that because of the letters he wrote to Arthur Greaves, his old friend, about all that period. But Tolkien, uh, I mean, uh, W.T. Patrick became this great influence in his life. And, uh, and by the way, when, uh, when Lewis left that, through uh, W.T. Kirkpatrick, he was able to win scholarship to Oxford in three different subject matters and got into Oxford University uh, with great success because of the tutoring of W.T. Kirkpatrick, who was his tutor from age 16 to 17. So at 17 then, he gets into Oxford and uh, his father got the letter. This letter was sent to his father by W.T. Kirkpatrick. And Kirkpatrick says of Lewis, he came to have great respect for Lewis. He said, his interests lie in the past in the realm of creative imagination. He has read more classics than any boy I ever had. But when a man is gifted with so much originality, there is a danger that his actual performance on paper may fail to convey an adequate expression. Wow. Wow. He uh, totally missed on that one because that looking over his shoulder, saying, know the, the meaning of every word you meant, you say, is a, became a huge hallmark in Lewis. And so Tolkien, or rather, uh, Kirkpatrick did not, did not get it right there. But it is true that Lewis uh, uh, was greatly influenced in a good way uh, by W.T. Kirkpatrick. He doesn't have to go to war is now in Oxford. But he doesn't have to go to war because he's Irish. And in World War I, and the Irish did not have to go to war. But Lewis, here's another insight into Lewis's character. He was so patriotic. And he felt that others, all these other young men that were in Oxford with him are going to war, including a guy who was his best friend named Paddy Moore, who also was killed in, on the front in the Battle of Seoul. So Lewis decides to volunteer to be in the British Army, and he does. And he becomes a second lieutenant, uh, actually in, in, a, in a much more worse kind of uh, unit and, and uh, assignment than, w, uh, than Tolkien had. He's put into a uh, 
what's called the Somerset. See, again, Somerset, because that's where a lot of the guys are from. The Somerset Light Infantry. And that means he's just a foot soldier. And as a second lieutenant, after some modest training at Kelby College in Oxford with Patty Moore and others that are also Oxford scholars that are all going to war, uh, he was put into that Somerset Light Infantry on November 7th, 1917. And he reaches the front lines of the Somme Valley, the same place where Tolkien was. Now Tolkien has gone from there because of his illness at age 19. So now the 19-year-old Lewis is a, is a field officer in, in the battle. And it so happens that the battle that he was in turned out to be the fiercest of all the battles just before the end of the war. And during that time, he gets also trench fever. The same thing that had hit Tolkien, but in a little less. And in the trench fever, he is sent to a field hospital in France. And this, in surprise by joy, he makes a big thing of this experience. While he's in the field hospital, he has, uh, uh, he has some time. It was here that I read my first volume, the first volume of G.K. Chesterton's essays. That would be Chesterton who wrote Orthodoxy. This is the book he would have read. The book by Chesterton, where Chesterton tells about becoming a Christian in the book Orthodoxy. I read the volume by Chesterton. I had never heard of him, and I had no idea what he stood for, nor can I quite understand why he made such an immediate conquest of me. It might have been expected that my pessimism, my atheism, my hatred of sentiment would have made him to me the least congenial of all authors. It could have been some providence or second cause of obscure kind that overrules previous tastes when it decides to bring two minds together. Liking an author may not be as involuntary and improbable as falling in love. I was by now a sufficiently experienced reader to distinguish liking from agreement. I did not need to accept what Chesterton said in order to enjoy it. And then he says what he liked about Chesterton. His humor was the kind of humor which I like best. Not jokes embedded in, embedded in a page like currants in a cake. Still less what I cannot endure, a general tone of flippancy. That would be cynicism. Uh, but humor, which is in, not in any way separable from the argument, but is rather, as Aristotle would say, the bloom on the dialectical, on the dialectic itself. In other words, the humor comes out of the argument, is in the argument. And then he gives an example. The sword glitters, not because the swordsman set out to make it glitter, but because he's fighting for his life, and therefore he's moving the sword very quickly. That's why it glitters. And then he says, moreover, strange as it may seem, I liked him for his, and this is the big line, I liked him for his goodness. Goodness is going to play such a big part in the story that we're going to look at this afternoon of both Lewis and Tolkien, it is, it's one of the love words in the New Testament. There was something good about uh, what, what, J.R., what, uh, what G.K. Chesterton was writing. There was something good. Also, Lewis, though he was technically an atheist, loved George MacDonald because he of goodness that he saw in George MacDonald. Here he is not a believer. Yet when he saw goodness, he admired it. And I want to read that line. I liked him for his goodness. I can attribute this taste to myself freely, even at that age, because it was a liking for goodness, which had nothing to do with any attempt to be good myself. I didn't want to be good, but I wanted to be around people who were good. I liked goodness when I saw it. And then he goes on to tell in fact, he has this famous line after that. He said, in reading Chesterton as in reading George MacDonald and George Herbert, I did not know what I would be getting myself in for. A young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere, as Herbert says, fine nets and stratagems. God is, if I may say it, very unscrupulous. And... It was goodness he saw, but not only there in that field office, uh, field in terms of uh, uh, reading Chesterton, he is now sent back to the front, and he's back at the front in the worst possible time of the Battle of Somme. 
By the way, he gets honored in that battle because 60 German soldiers surrendered. And he happened to be the young officer who received their surrender. And then he got one of the honors, the British aren't from the uh, uh, King's uh, Award for that. And by the way, he didn't accept the award because he said, I just was standing there and they came up with their arms up. So that I was not a hero. But 60 Germans surrendered and he got credit for it. Uh, but that was this terrible battle. And he, his officer that was in charge of him was a man named Johnson. And he says in Surprise by Joy, that man Johnson would have been my lifelong friend. He also was an Oxford scholar. He was the captain, Lewis, second lieutenant. And he's standing with Johnson and a corpsman. And the bomb hits, which kills Johnson right in front of his eyes. You should never say of Lewis that he was a sheltered man and was sheltered in experiences, just a, 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 you know, a, a, an intellectual who didn't know life. Standing right there, Johnson is killed. The corpsman is badly wounded. And Lewis will carry shrapnel in his chest for the rest of his life. And that happened in that battle. And then he goes back to England. Then he, of course, is evacuated because of that. Goes to England. He's there in a field hospital, in, in, a, in a military hospital in England for four months from July, June, July, all the way up to October. And then the war is over in, in December. And he writes to his father and says, you know, he, he realizes I've not been a very good son. And I've, done, I've made so much fun of you. He didn't say that exactly, but that's the truth. And but I would love it if you come over and see me. And, you know, for the four months he was in that field hospital, his father never came. All he had to do was come from Belfast over to uh, over to England and see his son. He never did. And in fact, at one point, Lewis said that people in the hospital think you're in my imagination, that I created you as a story. Come. The long and the short of it is I'm lonely. His father never came. His brother, who was in the army and actually was uh, in, uh, in, in World War II, too, is, by the way, his brother Warren was at Dunkirk, was evacuated at Dunkirk because he was a, also an officer. Uh, he went to Sandhurst. He didn't go to Oxford. He went to Sandhurst, was a British officer. But his brother was absolutely outraged that, that uh, his father never came. Listen to this, what his brother wrote in the memoirs uh, of, in the Lewis book. He said, one would have thought it impossible that any father could resist an appeal of this kind coming at such a moment. But my father was a peculiar man in some respects, in none more than his almost pathological hatred of taking any step which involved a break in his dull routine of his daily existence. So Jack remained unvisited and was deeply hurt at a neglect which he considered inexcusable. Feeling himself to have been rebuffed by his father, he turned to Mrs. Moore and to, uh, uh, as to a mother seeking the affection that was apparently denied him at home. And in this, Warren explains why Lewis, strangely, as he got out of the field hospital, his own best friend, Patty Moore's mother, uh, they had made a vow to each other that if either of them died in the war, they would take care of the other's parent. Of course, Patty Moore would never have taken care of Albert Lewis, but uh, Patty Moore died in the war. And so Lewis felt obligated to fulfill that vow. And he did. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Moore, uh, she was not his lover, as A.N. Wilson was trying to posit in his biography. He, he treated her and he always called her my mother. Uh, he had nicknames for her. Minto was a nickname because she loved Minto mince. So he nicknamed her that. But uh, he nicknames everybody, though. But he, uh, he treated her like his mother. And she uh, they lived uh, in the same house. And then when they bought the kilns after the death of his father, they pooled her mother money with his money. And they bought the kilns. And that's where Warren lived with them in the kilns. And that's where they were until she died in, in 1950. So Lewis stayed to that vow. And, but that explains it. Now, I do want to rehabilitate, though, the relationship with his father, because later on, he does reconcile with his father. The father never liked Mrs. Moore and never wanted to be around her particularly, but uh, he, uh, they were reconciled. And uh, Lewis uh, did come into a, what I would call a good relationship with his father, finally. But here's a letter that helps you see that reconciliation. 
he, he writes to his father. His father, by the way, did apologize for not coming over to see him. And then the father is keeping asking about his medical condition because he knows that he had the shrapnel and he knows that he was in the field hospital for all that time. So Lewis writes to his father, what a nice pair. In the same letter, you say quite truly that I have never told you to what extent I'm likely to be disabled by my wounds. So you see, because he never went over to the hospital to see him. And now he says, you're, you're, you're angry that I haven't told you how I'm going to be disabled. And then you're not telling me about what happened in Squeaky's hand. That was the nickname for the doctor. That he's going to the doctor, but he's not telling about what he's having treated by the doctor. So he says, what a pair we are. I won't tell you what they, they're saying about my wounds, and you don't tell me what Squeaky tells you. Because see, you got to realize Lewis nicknames everybody. What Squeaky says, it, you say it's unspecified. That's what he said. Well, let's make a bargain. This is great. Here's the son now re reconciling with his father. But now listen to this. Let's make a bargain. Here is my health report. Uh... The effects of the wound in general movement are practically nil. I can do everything except hold my left arm straight above my head. Which I don't want to do anyway. <laughs> Is that a great line? If you've got a physical problem, take that approach. It really gets you, gets you a lot of ways. I'll read that line again because that's, that's Lewis's humor. The effects of the wound are general. Uh, he said, here's my health report. Uh, the effects of the wound in general movement are practically nil. I can do everything except hold my left arm straight above my head, which I don't want to do anyway. The effects on general health are very small. I have had one or two stoppages of breath. <laughs> that's small. And breathing problems, which I am told are not unusual after a chest wound and which will soon disappear. And of course, I still get tired easily and have a few headaches in the evening. On the moves, on the nerves, there are two effects which will probably go with quiet and rest. And then the other, listen to this, this is so moving. If you know anything about post-traumatic stress that people in warfare have had. Listen to this. The other is nightmares, or rather the same nightmare over and over again. Nearly everyone, notice again, he discounts it. Nearly everyone has it, and though it's very unpleasant, it is passing and will do no harm. So as you can see, I'm almost status quo. You like that guy? I love C.S. Lewis. And I love the way he did reconcile with his father. And they did have a great relationship after that. But he had to clear the air on that. What a pair we are. I'm glad he said it that way. Now, he goes to Oxford. He, he has to find a job. And he finally becomes a fellow and gets made a fellow at Modeling College in 1925 which is the rank as tutor and modeling college. And he gets that, gets that post. And that's where he meets J.R. Tolkien. Tolkien's at Merton College, and Tolkien is now a full professor. Lewis is a tutor. By the way, Lewis will stay a tutor all the way up until 1954 when he goes to Cambridge as full professor. That's another whole story in itself, and that's another lecture that you need to learn someday, that he was... Uh, he was three times promoted for full professor, but three times was defeated. Tolkien himself promoted him three times for full professor at Oxford, and three times he was defeated. And most people believe it's because he did religious writing, wrote out of his field. And you can write stories, but you can't write out of your field and without getting punished for it at Oxford. And so he was punished. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I, I was there for the 100th celebration of Lewis, I went to Oxford for that. And the rector of Oxford, who'd be the president of Oxford, spoke. And his opening sentence was, uh, we treated C.S. Lewis shabbily at Oxford. That other school, you know, Oxford never mentions Cambridge by name. That other school honored him. And he became full professor at Magdalen College in Oxford. He was at Modeling College, same saint, St. Mary Magdalene. 
in Oxford, in Magdalen, in, in Cambridge. And that's where he completed his career. But, uh, and, and you know, it's funny, the minute Cambridge called him, then immediately Magdalen College offered him the full professorship. And he said, no, I made a commitment. But he always kept his home still in Oxford and came back and forth between Oxford and Cambridge. So anyway, he meets Tolkien, and that is quite an amazing story in itself. When he meets Tolkien, uh, uh, he, uh, Tolkien is a philologist and is, an, is interested in stories. And that interest in stories uh, is, uh, is the thing that is, became so important uh, for Lewis. In fact, I'll read what he says. He says, uh, friendship with J.R. Tolkien marked the breakdown of two old prejudices for me. Uh, first, I had been implicitly warned never to trust a papist. In other words, a Catholic. He was from Northern Ireland, after all. I was told never to trust a Catholic. And at my first coming to the English faculty at, at Bodlin, explicitly, I was told to never trust a philologist. And Tolkien was both. And they hit it off. They hit it off in this a little club that Tolkien had already started called the Coal Biters. See, from that coal trains that made such an impression on him. And that was people who wanted to study Icelandic folk stories. And he, Lewis had to learn the Icelandic language in order to be in that study group with Tolkien. And he did it. And they just loved the Icelandic folk stories, what they call the Northern Stories. And then he became his friend. And they spent a great deal of time. In fact, Tolkien was, uh, they, they, they had a very marvelous uh, friendship. And then one night, uh, Lewis gradually is drifting uh, away from his atheism. As a matter of fact, he finally kneels one day. He tells us in Surprised by Joy. And I decided that I decided I believed in the existence of God. I was the most unwilling convert in all of England, he said, because I exist, I decided I believed in the existence of God. Before that, he had had his own sort of, uh, uh, his own uh, uh, description of what he felt was ultimate reality. And he, he, he called it this. He, the ultimate reality, is the opaque center of all existences, the thing that simply and entirely is the fountain of facthood. You can see the influence of W.T. Kirkpatrick, but notice it's not personal. It's just an opaque center of everything. And that was as close as he could get to believe, that's, that was his belief in God. And that night, he has a, an evening with Tolkien and Dyson. And they, it's called the, the Great Addison Walk. It, it, it's, it, they start in Lewis's quarters, and then they walk out on Addison's Walk. And if you go to Oxford and go to Addison's Walk, you'll see a, a bronze plaque on the, in the walk with a poem by C.S. Lewis to honor that walk in the life of Lewis, Tolkien, and Dyson. And in that walk, Tolkien created an argument for Lewis, and it became an amazing argument. He said, you know, Lewis, in our stories... What we're loving in our stories is that there are two things always present in a great story. One, you need to have a sense of overwhelming crisis to make a story work. What you can call catastrophe. There has to be a catastrophic center to every, every great story. Otherwise, why bother with the story? Or why bother tracking with people if there isn't some huge crisis that is at the core? And that's called catastrophe. And then in every great story, there has got to be, and now here Tolkien, the philologist, created a new word from the Greek language. He said, in every great story, there's got to be a EU. In, in Greek, if you put EU in front of a word, it means good. Like the word logos and put EU in front of it, it's eulogy, good word. Or phono, sound, euphemism, good sound. But take it in front of Catastrophe. By the way, catastrophe in Greek means the collapse, the collapse of things. And if you put it in front of that EU, uh, you have EU catastrophe. And in every great story, there is a U catastrophe moment. 
a sudden turn, a sudden turn that is the you catastrophic moment when you discover this good center that is a person. It's personal. And then, uh, then Tolkien went on to say, in our stories, uh, the you catastrophe is in our imagination. But there is a true you catastrophe. There is a true uh, sudden turn. And that true catastrophe, is, the true myth, is Jesus Christ. He is the you catastrophe of all time. Except in our stories, it's in our imagination. But he is real. He is real. There's a real person there at the core of that turn. And that was the talk that went way into the night. And uh, uh, by the way, Tolkien used to get in trouble with Edith because he'd get home so late from these times with Lewis and, and, these, and these other guys when they were having their talks. And that, the next day, Lewis got into the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle. He tells us in a letter he wrote, I got into my brother's sidecar and rode to Whipsonade Zoo. At the beginning of the ride, I did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. At the end of the ride, I believed in the deity of Jesus Christ, the reality of Jesus Christ. He's not the opaque center of factness. He is the person who's at the center of factness. I believed in the deity of Jesus Christ. And then he has a little joke. He says, nothing happened during the motorcycle ride. Uh, but the long talk last night with Tolkien and Dyson had much to do with it. And that's the, that was Lewis's discovery of Jesus Christ, 1931. And the rest is history from there, uh, which we'll take a, a, a better look at uh, in, our next, in our next hour. Now, let's see. We have a break right now. And uh, then we'll have some... Uh, 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 so some food, and then we'll come back exactly at what is it? I'll give some instruction, Earl. Oh, we'll come back at 10.15. Uh, How is everyone doing? Good so far? <laughs> Earl, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, you know, Tolkien Lewis, undoubtedly remarkable storytellers. But there's something powerful when their lives, their life stories are told by a remarkable storyteller. So mm -hmm. thank you. You have done them a great <laughs> honor. Mm -hmm.